Hello everyone, um, my name is Gabriel Stein. I am Director Asset Management Services of Oxford Economics. Uh, welcome back to one of our irregular series of podcasts. I'm sitting here with Christine Shields, who is one of our lead economists, and we're going to discuss uh, Chinese politics and the impact on economics. I want to stress that because, of course, we are not uh, political consultants. Nevertheless, from time to time, our analysis has to veer into politics. And this is perhaps um, one of these times to give you a little bit of background. Uh, over the past three days, the um, 10th to the 13th of August, the Chinese authorities have devalued the RMB three times, each time saying that this was a once-off and would not be followed by further measures. Uh, and this comes at a time when the Chinese economy is slowing sharply and at a time when the Chinese leadership is uh, closeted in the seaside resort of Beidai He, uh, discussing the outline for the next five-year plan. And so I think the first thing we should ask is, um, what is really happening? Is Xi Jinping moving away from being a banner uh, holder of reform. When, when he became Secretary General and, and, and President, he um, was very much, uh, he nailed his collars very firmly to the mast of economic reform, but he seems to have moved away from that, Christine. Well, I'm not sure he has fully moved away from it, actually. There, there were some rather positive aspects of the developments in the last three days. But there are certainly signs that he has moved to some extent away from reform. I'll come back to the positive signs in a minute. Um, in terms of moving away from reform, the economy, developments in the economy have to some extent prompted the change this week because, as you rightly say, performance has deteriorated and there's very little feel good around in the Chinese economy at the moment particularly with the stock market gains evaporating. It's, I was going to say that's part of it, it the, stock, the weak stock market. Absolutely. I mean, the, and the, the market is still up on where it was a year ago, but the bubbly gains have largely gone. In spite of a series of measures from the authorities. Despite a series of possibly misguided measures by the authorities to intervene, because they really have stepped in to interrupt the market mechanism in the stock market. And it's very much, I think, a politically inspired intervention. But clearly, you know, when you've had a period of an asset bubble blowing, there are positive wealth effects while it's, while it's, while it's building, mm -hmm. but then once it starts to burst, there's negative wealth effects, and it's never clear that the losers are the same as the winners. Well, they rarely are, of course. Um, now, part of the uh, problem that, that uh, at least it seems to me, we're, we're seeing in China right now is the um, political decision-making paralysis that, that is partly an effect of uh, Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign. Um, I, I should say the idea of getting rid of corruption is, of course, an excellent one, but the problem is there are only two ways of getting rid of corruption historically. One is to have well-paid civil servants with transparent jobs. The Singapore model. Uh, the Singapore model, if you want, uh, and transparent decision-making. Yeah. Um, and this used to be the Chinese model, by the way. This was the Chinese model that was the basis for the civil service reforms in Britain and Sweden and so on in the 19th century, a meritocracy. And China is not moving in this direction. And the other way of, of getting rid of corruption is, of course, to eliminate anyone who is corrupt. And historically, we have seen that that works in the short time, but eventually the people around you, who by the very nature of the system will also be tainted by corruption, turn against you. And it seemed to me that initially, when Xi Jinping started the anti-corruption campaign, it was a question of getting rid of his predecessor's loyalists and, and cementing his own, own hold on power. But this now seems to be going further. It may be that he really believes he can get rid of corruption this way. I, I, think, he, I think he is very firmly determined to get rid of corruption. But as you rightly say, it's a very difficult thing to actually eliminate, particularly in, in, a, in a country like China, where the 
the system is still very centralised. And, you know, it's the interplay between the regions and the centre and the, the, the differing incentives for each. And where above Even, all decision making is very opaque. And decision making is very opaque, which is why it's interesting all this is happening now, when the leadership is um, else, you know, away contemplating the planning for the next five years. But the, behind it all is the perennial tension between the reformists and the conservatives. And clearly there's periods when the reformists have been very much um, holding the upper hand. And equally, there are times when the Conservatives move ahead, which I think was the case, as I've alluded to, with the stock market. Um, and, you know, you, the, 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 I guess that's an element of the winners and losers on, the, on, on, on whatever the issue is. But the problems are very deep-seated in China. This goes back decades, really. And, you know, she's, she is quite right to try and address these issues. Um, for particularly as, as the economy now is largely private sector and I think the traditionalists haven't quite appreciated how much the levers of power that they or levers of economic power that they can manipulate have changed over the past decade particularly over the last few years I think. I think that's true what, what worries me here I suppose is a scenario which perhaps is somewhat far-fetched but something along these lines um, so, so we have the anti-corruption campaign which admittedly has also caused some policy paralysis but above all we have the weakness in the economy which is is quite substantial um, our various attempts to gauge what underlying Chinese growth is uh, indicate that current output growth probably is um, already below 6% and might be less than that. Um, and we believe, because it's been the case for the uh, past few leadership generations, that the way the Chinese political system works is that you get two five-year terms uh, as a pair. One is president and party leader and the other is prime minister. So we now have Xi Jinping as president and Li Keqiang as prime minister. But of course, there's nothing uh, predestined about that, um, even without uh, without uh, any kind of open, I'm trying to think of a word here. Even without a coup, but that's the wrong word. But but let's say but in, 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 it is possible that opponents of economic reform could blame Xi Jinping for what's going on, and therefore, and and also not least because the anti-corruption campaign can come too close to them, and therefore in perfectly, let us say, legal or constitutional forms, uh, there would be a move to deny him a second five-year term. That's a possibility, of course, but I think, it, t well, two things really. First is that when, when he came to power, he took on the control of the military immediately. Yes, he became chairman of the military commission. Yes, and that was a, that was actually a big step indicating that he actually was in some ways more powerful than his predecessor was. So I think to see him not serve a second term would be a particular, particularly large fall from grace. And I think also that the second thing would be that the slowdown in the economy to some extent has to be expected because you can't continue to grow at 10% forever. And, you know, okay, went from 10% to 90% to 8%. You can't sustain that pace of growth over decades. In you fact, China has already sustained it for far longer than anyone else. Absolutely. In history. And, it's, and it's caught up in a, in a dramatic fashion, but it can't continue to keep growing at that pace. That's true. But it might be, I, I suppose, what I. What, what I'm getting at is, whatever the reason might be to replace Xi, if indeed that were to happen in 2017-18, and, I, and I, I grant, by the way, that the likelihood is very small, but if that were to happen, we would almost have to assume that the replacement would come from the ranks of those opposed to economic reform, someone who believes that the tried and true methods of export-led and investment-led growth 
that have served China well in the past would serve well in the future, yeah. even though that is highly unlikely, if, even if it, for the simple reason that returns on investment can simply not keep up yeah. with it. Yeah, I think that's right, but there are, there's a, another consideration to bring in here, and that's the, 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 the appointment of the technocrats behind the top-line leadership. You know, one of the most important uh, players in this game, if you like, is the governor of the Central Bank, the People's Bank of China. Yes. And he is very much a pro-reform uh, candidate. Now, at some point, his term will come to an end, and he will it's have to be replaced. It's already been extended beyond the normal... It's been extended, normal, absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah. And, you know, it, it's not clear how, how long he will continue to stay in post. And then, of course, the key question is who replaces him, and of what, you, which side of this reformist versus traditionalist divide they come from. And, you know, it's been the People's Bank and the, C, the um, China Bank Regulatory uh, Commission, they're both very important players in the, the pace and character of the reform in China going forward. And in both cases, they've actually been reasonably impressive in recent years. And of course, they've they've played well with the West. They're um, they're standing in the West with the IMF and with with, with other uh, reg regional countries. Have been actually very positive. So, if I'm the pessimist here and fearing the worst, you're slightly more optimistic. In your, she will be reappointed, and she is actually still on the whole uh, the reformist. That we hoped he was. I think, as as we said at the outset, behind the uh, the devaluations, there have been some positive developments, which have received a lot less headline press. Anyway, um, in particular, the um, the fluctuation band of the exchange rate is to be widened, yes. and that will enable more market influence on the exchange rate. The other um, the other the other development is that. Um, there's been a sale of central bank certificates of deposit at an unregulated interest rate. Yes. And that's a very important development because it means that market forces will play a greater role in setting both interest rates and back to the exchange rate exchange rates. And that is, well, both these are very important developments which the IMF has welcomed. Um, and it probably, in, in both cases, is a step closer towards China eventually having a fully convertible currency and perhaps ultimately becoming a reserve currency. Well, becoming a reserve currency, that's ultimately a decision not made by the Chinese or even by the IMF. It's made by others if they want to keep the RMB as part of their reserves, Indeed. as some of them already do. Well, uh, yes. But yes, I agree, the importance of the RMB will grow substantially yeah. if the currency I mean, is convertible. China's tipped its toe in the water there by having the bilateral uh, conversion deals with with country the by swaps, country, yes, and 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 that's actually a, a, another important development that's been brewing over a number of years and is a very important step. It, it, it's the way China does reform. China doesn't generally do big bang reforms. It does iterative reforms, and it tries a little bit. If it works, it does another little bit, and more and more, until eventually, you, that you know, some point down the line. You find that the you know where you are now compared with where you were say 18 months ago is a big step change but it's happened in lots of baby steps and that's I think what's going on here well I hope you're right I, I am more concerned I think the economy is, is uh, the current weakness uh, threatens a, a, a pullback to to uh, uh, methods that would actually be bad for China, bad for the world, and move China in a, in a, uh, into a, a cul-de-sac. Nevertheless, I hope that you're more right than I am. Well, Thank a, sorry, okay, just one, one, yeah. one more point I was going to say. That's, what you say is certainly true, but I think what is absolutely true is that the renminbi is no more a one-way bet. And that's probably the lesson of what's happened yes, this think, week. You're right. That's the most important yeah. point, perhaps. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, we will be back with further podcasts about any topic in the future.